We're continuing on with the Renaissance period. Following the death of Josquin and following the Protestant Reformation begun by Martin Luther, the church realized that it was losing a lot of members, a lot of money, and so they began the Counter-Reformation, saying that they recognized that there were certain things that had gone awry and that they were willing to fix and they wanted to bring everybody back. Some people did return, but then others kept uh, leaving as well. So during the 1520s and 1530s, the church st started to talk about things that they could do better until they decided to form a committee, uh, a council, if you will. Uh, schools, colleges, churches were notorious for committee work. And so what was formed was the Council of Trent, and they met for 18 years between 1545 and 1563. And their goal was to regulate every single aspect of the religious discipline. Of course, that's going to take a look at a lot of different things. I can remember uh, when I joined the second church that I had uh, where I was the music director. When I was interviewed, I noticed as I was walking through the sanctuary that it was a beautiful sanctuary. It had stunning um, stained glass windows. But then on the walls, there was these huge places where the paint was crackling off the walls and there were, you could see multiple colors underneath. So it was obvious to me and anybody who walked into the sanctuary that it needed to be painted. Shortly after I was hired, a decorating committee was formed and um, there were two decorators on the committee and they did not see eye to eye on what color to paint the walls. And so um, certain members of the committee drifted over to one side and the others to the other until it just became a nightmare. One of the decorators actually got so upset over the committee work that she and her family left the church. And so it was two years later after the formation of that decorating committee before paint ever went on the walls. So if a church now in the 21st century is gonna argue and fuss and fight about the paint color of the sanctuary, then Think about all that went on during the discussions of the Council of Trent way back when, when they were actually considering things that were affecting the souls of their parishioners. Well, of course, music is a portion of the Roman Catholic Church service and the Mass, and so there were a lot of different ways that the Council wanted to fix the musicians and the music. And so I wanted just to read a few of those to you. This is not something that you need to know for the test, but I just wanted you to understand what all the council was about. They objected to the corruption of chant by the soloists, by the singers. Chant was still being used in different um, sections. A lot of times the composers would create a new mass and they would write the whole mass ordinary. But if it was a particular occasion or a particular time of the day when you needed some proper prayers added in, they would use oftentimes the old Gregorian chant for that. Well, let's say I was the cantor of the choir, the lead singer. Then I might have a lot of solo moments in one of those chants. I, at that time, needed more money to take care of myself and, and my family, so I would elaborate my singing, add all kinds of different things, hoping that someone in the congregation would enjoy my performance so much that they might hire me to perform at their upcoming party or funeral or wedding or whatever it might be. So I was using it as an audition process. So I was not singing exactly the shape of the line originally formatted by the gnomes back in the day of the medieval period. And the church did not want that. They wanted the music to be sung as it was written. They objected to certain instrumentation. I've had many students to ask me, well, why did they do that or how could they do that? Well, they could do that because they felt that they, they were the church and they were the final answer to a lot of these um, rules. So a lot of instruments were deemed as secular at this time and they were destroyed or burned. So we lost a lot of period instrumentation. They objected to secular melodies being used within the Mass. And this is what brought a halt to Machaut's career. He was writing secular tunes and the popular ones he would use later in a Mass. That was a no-no, no crossing over. And they just really <laughs> objected to the musicians. Uh, they talked about the irreverent attitudes of the musicians. Well, 
in connection to the Mass was the Holy Eucharist or the Holy Communion service. In my church, we uh, have communion on the first Sunday of each month, and we have uh, bread and, uh, for the body of Christ, and we use Welch's grape juice for the uh, blood of Christ. But in certain traditions in certain churches, including the Roman Catholic, they use wine. Well, during the, after the saying of the Mass, what was happening, the priest would realize, because they would mark the level of the wine in the decanter or vessel that they had, that at the next saying of the Mass, the members of the choir, the members of the music family of the church, they were very happy. <laughs> and there was a lot less wine in the bottle. So they had delved into that and um, having a good old time. Well, they just wanted to make sure that everybody was acting properly during the period. And so they wanted to keep the musicians' um, attitudes in check. But the biggest thing that the Council of Trent objected to was the multi-text polyphonic motets. Back to Periton. Periton developed the motet and he was using two texts with two melodies and a line of harmony. This progressed. In the Renaissance, a lot of composers would take a whole setting of the Mass the five mass ordinaries, and they say, oh, okay, well, there's going to be these two propers. So we have seven prayers that need to be sung. They would compose a motet that had eight lines, seven lines of melody and a line of harmony underneath it so that you could say the mass in one fell swoop. You could get through it in two or three minutes and be done. There's no way, no one word, not even one syllable of the text was more important than anything else. Remember that from the, our first lecture in the medieval period? There's no way that the intent of the Mass could be achieved with all of these texts sounding simultaneously, simultaneously in that matter. So the council started to layer upon layer all of these rules that nearly tied the hands of the composers to the point where they had to go back to the monophonic text, uh, monophonic chant. And you've heard people before the old cliche, well, it worked once for us, it'll still work today. That's what was going on. They were basically uh, making us go back to the Gregorian chant. But in steps, another very important composer who had a very important person's ear that could convince everybody that music still could have freedom and creativity and serve the needs of the church. So our next composer that I'm discussing is Palestrina. His God-given name was Giovanni Pierluigi, but he was from the township of Palestrina. And a lot of people are sometimes known by the uh, town of where they were born, and that's the case here with Palestrina. Palestrina was born sometime around 1525, sh shortly after the Counter-Reformation began, and he lived almost to the end of that century. He passed away in 1594. I consider him the best Renaissance composer and a lot of people give him that designation. But I wanted to be a little bit more specific with you in your PowerPoint. He is certainly the most important Roman Catholic composer from the Renaissance. Born in the church, educated by the church, uh, a big believer in the uh, Counter-Reformation. He wanted to help the church as much, much as possible, eventually finding his way to becoming the music director at the Vatican. And so we all know who lives there. So Palestrina was in the right place at the right time to help music. During his lifetime, during his composing career, Palestrina composed over 100 masses, complete masses, like we were doing with uh, Mass Show at the end of the uh, medieval period. That's continuing and will continue from this time forward. He wanted to help show the council that they were being a little too confining to music. So in 1567, he composed a mass called the Pope Marcellus Mass. Dotted every I and crossed every T by the rules and regulations, but it was still new and modern for this time and very free-flowing. He used just one text at one time. He didn't use the multitude of different texts. And um, he composed the complete setting and another way that this is showing progression is that at times the Pope Marcellus Mass calls for a six-part divisi, 
or a six-part section. So in order to perform this, in an all-male choir situation, you would have the boys singing soprano and alto, the adult men divided into two tenor sections, and then into two bass sections. So six different parts at, at times throughout the performance. I want you to find a performance of the Gloria from the Pope Marcellus Mass and listen to it. It's in binary form. It starts off with the Gloria in Excelsis Deo that is sung by a soloist. Anything new had to be grounded in the old, so Palestrina borrows a, an old Gloria tune to start it all off. Once that soloist is finished and the choir joins in, then it's new music from that point forward of Palestrina's. But there'll come a point about halfway through where the music will come to a close, then the second start, uh, part will uh, begin and then you'll have the ending. Really listen to, for the end when you have all the amens because you have all the different parts now being used and you can hear the richness and the depth of the music and you can also hear how much progression that we've had since the early days of the medieval period. I want to tell you a little story. I uh, had several different music history courses during my undergraduate times and I had these teachers who would say, oh, the music of the Renaissance, it's so beautiful, it's so heavenly, it's so wonderful. And I would hear it and I would listen to it and I would think, yeah, 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 you're just telling me that because you're paid to tell me that. Well, time went on and, and after I graduated, I was able to go to Europe uh, with a uh, choir tour. And we went to the Czech Republic and, and into Austria. Well, we landed in the city of Prague, and we got to tour that town, and then we went to some smaller towns in the Czech Republic, and on, one, on the first Sunday of our trip, we were in the city of Bruno. Bruno was a very small town. They didn't have a huge cathedral. Their church actually was just a part of, of a city block or a, a town square section, but it had these huge ornate wooden doors, and you would walk through the doors, and the church itself was a couple of stories tall and it was still built with the stone and had all of this uh, wonderful architecture on the inside. And so on that day we sang some of our sacred songs that we had brought with us on the tour for, to perform for the church and then we sat back and listened to their service. And on that particular day, I don't know if it was, if it was because uh, they knew that a group from America was coming or not, but they actually performed one of Palestrina's masses. Palestrina's music has never left the Roman Catholic Church repertoire. So he's a very important uh, person in the confines of musical history. But on that day, on that occasion, in that place, I finally understood what my uh, history instructors had been saying. The music of Palestrina was heavenly. It was angelic because these composers knew the place, the environment that they were working with. They knew that the music would be created by the voices and then it would linger in the hall. And as you were sitting there, the music would envelop you, the original surround sound. Why am I telling you all this? Well, if you get a chance, if you have been to Europe, try to hear music in a cathedral. If you know that you're planning a trip, go to hear music, whether it's a church service or a concert or whatever. But it's a wonderful place to be able to hear with such great clarity all the different parts. There are a lot of places in the States where uh, that is capable as well. But being in one of those magnificent structures, one of those great churches or cathedrals, really makes it all um, be put into place for you. So that concludes a lot of our discussions of the Renaissance. I'm going to talk a little bit at the Rena of the Renaissance at the beginning of the Baroque period, but this completes all of the material that you need to know for the first test. So please take a look at your study guide, take a look at all the PowerPoints that are in relationship to these lectures, and uh, start preparing for the first test. I'll see you next time.